Hey everyone, and welcome to this Ask Me Anything Nonprofit Storytelling Edition. My name is Vanessa Chase Lakshan, and I'm super happy some of you are tuning in today with your questions. Uh, so we can have some conversation and talk a little bit more about nonprofit storytelling. So, just for some uh, context, I suppose. Uh, I did a webinar last week, which some of you were probably at, where we talked about how to tell stories that pull in the right heartstrings. And I was so overwhelmed by how many questions folks submitted, probably because there were almost 625 of you on the webinar. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity just to answer more of those questions and to also answer other ones that you may have. So how this is gonna work if you're just tuning in, uh, is I'm gonna be answering questions from the webinar first. I have a handful that I pulled out and I thought I'd start with those. And then if you're tuning in and you have questions you'd like me to answer as well, you can just submit those through the chat box, which I think should be on the right-hand side of your screen, but wherever it is in YouTube, <laughs> feel free to use that and send in your questions. I would also love for you, if you're just tuning in and hopping in on the call here with us, to uh, say hi and introduce yourself. It's always great to see who is tuning in and joining us for these. So be sure to say hello. Um, and while some of you are getting settled in, I'm just going to dive right in and start answering some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my questions list and we'll get started here. Um, so the first question I wanted to answer was from Anne. And Anne asked me, how do you organize a story to engage people? Which is a really good question. I know a lot of you are telling stories to try to engage audiences, to grow your social media followings, grow your brand, things like that. You might also be telling stories to raise money, of course, which is what a lot of us are doing. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is actually define what you mean by engage. I think a lot of organizations use the term engagement in a very broad, undefined way. And so I think to figure out how to engage people, you have to define what that looks like in terms of an outcome for your story. So I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about what that actually is. And then I would say the best thing you can do is use a call to action that reflects the type of engagement you want from people. Maybe it's sharing the story with others, maybe it's making a donation, maybe it's something else entirely, but just think about what that could be and then choose a call to action that really reflects that for your story and for the goals you have for it. All right, so Christine asked me, how, um, where and how do you fold an ask into a story? Really good question. So some of you have heard me say before that telling a story just for the sake of telling a story is a really terrible use of our resources and time as organizations. And if you're going to be telling a story, hoping to raise money from it, we of course have to integrate and ask into that story and really make it purposeful and tell people what it is we want from them as a result of reading the story and engaging with it. So for a fundraising appeal, if I was working on that, I can tell you the thing that I try to do is I always try to put my first ask about 150 words into um, the appeal. And I say 150 words because 150 words is enough of kind of word real estate, so to speak, to characterize the problem and to also give people enough context to make sense of the ask. One of the things I see happen quite frequently, especially in email appeals, is there'll be an ask really close to the top of the email. But the problem is we haven't given the audience enough information to find that ask really compelling. So that's why I recommend organizations try to get 150 words or thereabouts in before they make that first ask. And then the second place I would fold an ask into in a story is probably at the end as well. Hopefully someone has read all the way there. And if not, they've hopefully seen the first one in that email as well. All right, let's see here. And for those of you who are tuning in, welcome. And if you would like to ask questions here, feel free to send them in by the chat box and be happy to answer them for you. I'm just starting with a few questions from our webinar last week. And then we'll get to some more here in a couple minutes as well. Okay, so next question I wanted to answer, and I have a feeling this will probably be applicable for a couple of you at least. Uh, Kylie had asked me, what is my process for collecting stories and building a bank of stories to pull from when needed? So really good question. And if you're not sure what a story bank is, or maybe you haven't heard that term before, it's essentially just a collection of stories that you have that you can use for content and for fundraising. And one of the reasons you may want that is so that you don't have to constantly be looking for stories anytime you have a need to tell a story in communications or in fundraising. And there's certainly some benefits to it. Um, some organizations refer to this as their story library, their story bank. 
anything like that. So maybe you've heard those terms before. So in terms of building this up and actually finding stories, I'll tell you kind of my own process, which may be helpful for you. And I have to say, Kylie, I love that you use the word process because I think of storytelling as a process. And this is something that I think is really helpful to have in mind when you're trying to figure out how to collect stories. It really is a process, not necessarily an outcome. So I start by mapping out my opportunities for storytelling. So I might look at my fundraising or communications calendar and really think about, you know, let's say in the next six months, what are the opportunities I have for storytelling and what are the messages or calls to action that I want to pair with those stories out in the wild. And the reason I say the messages and the calls to action is because I want to make sure I find stories that are really complementary to those things. I want to make sure that we find stories that are compelling and help build the case for the message and the ask that I'm going to put out there. So that's where I would definitely start. Um, and that gives me ultimately clarity about the kinds of stories I want to tell and the kinds of stories I need to look for within an organization. And from there, what I try to do is really work collaboratively with other colleagues, volunteers, um, even board members sometimes to try to find those stories and source them from within the organization and to ultimately conduct some interviews. And I think the next step will sometimes depend for, for people and their preferences. I personally, once I've done an interview, prefer to write sort of a, a rough draft of the story right away because it's fresh in my mind. And I feel like uh, that's when I'm most able to capture all the things that I want to capture. Whereas if I do an interview and I just leave my notes aside for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or even like a month down the road, um, sometimes not all of that information is as fresh in my mind. And so it, it's harder for me to kind of recreate the story that I want to tell. So I prefer to do a rough draft as a part of that process. And then that way I have something to work with. So when I want to use that in an appeal or communication, I can come back and rework it or shape it to what I'm thinking about using it for. All right. Okay. Um, Christy asked me, uh, our volunteers look at us with blank stares when we ask them to share stories about our clients. What are the right questions to ask volunteers to elicit stories? Great question. And I have to say, you're probably not alone in that kind of response. I've worked with many organizations over the years when, you know, they ask other staff or volunteers or even their board members for stories. Uh, people just aren't sure what to say. And I have to say that part of that is because a lot of people don't think about what they have to share as being, you know, a quote unquote story. They don't think they have good stories to tell. There's a lot of kind of judgment layered over onto that. So the thing that I would suggest doing, Christy, is to ask specific questions that can evoke anecdotes from people. Um, so it may be something like, tell me your favorite memory from volunteering, or have you met someone through our program or service that's really stuck out in your mind? Or is there an experience that you've had volunteering with this program or service that was really memorable for you? Maybe something that's uh, was really good, or maybe it stuck out because it was funny, or there was some other emotion that got evoked there. But I would try asking people questions like that that are a little bit more pointed rather than just saying, tell, like, tell me a story from your time as a volunteer, which can be a little broad and um, you know, doesn't offer people quite as much guidance for figuring out what it is they want to share with folks. So that is where I would start. <laughs> All right, um, Cindy, yeah, good question. So how do you tell stories when you have to maintain HIPAA compliance? Great question. So I know some of you work in healthcare. Um, so if you do, you're probably familiar with HIPAA. And if you're not a nonprofit working in healthcare, this is essentially uh, federal legislation that protects patient privacy. Um, and if you're not in healthcare, you may still be thinking about kind of the ethics around storytelling, which is a very important thing to be considering. So how do you maintain people's privacy? How do you tell their story with what I always think of as, you know, integrity to that person's experience um, and making sure it's not a way, it, it's not being told in a way that feels exploitive or I would say like overly dramatized in a way that's not actually true to, to what happened. So my understanding of HIPAA specifically, uh, the HIPAA compliance, is that you just need someone's permission to share their story. So the assumption that most of us make with this is that people do not want to share their stories. Like they've been through a very private experience and therefore like there's just no opportunities to tell stories in that context at our organization. 
But I want to just say that that's not a great assumption to work from. <laughs> so uh, what I would do is just start by finding people who have maybe had really positive experiences with your organization. If you're a hospital, maybe it's something like a grateful patient or a grateful family. Um, if you're in some other kind of medical care organization, just think about you know folks who've been through your services or programs that might have had a really positive experience or positive outcome. Um, and you might need to work with program staff to identify those folks and just approach them and say, like, we're gathering stories. We'd like to talk about how our organization has helped people. You seem like uh, someone who's really benefited from some of the work that we do. And, you know, would you be willing to share that story with our community and can talk about what that looks like? And, you know, I always try to reassure people that they have, you know, agency over how that story is shared and, and what we say about them uh, to really make them feel comfortable and empowered in the process. And, you know, if they say yes, one of the things you want to do is just make sure you have a release form available for them to sign so that everything is above board. Uh, if you do find, though, that you're really having trouble telling um, stories that speak to grandma service, uh, services experience, um, one of the things you could do is turn to your staff members instead because they can speak to the impact of the program. They can tell their stories from their perspective. Um, and that can be just another really great way to connect donors and to connect your community to the outcomes and the impact of the work. Um, although, you know, just from a slightly different angle that can still be really effective. <laughs> so, uh, and I, you know, there was another question, I didn't jot this one down before we got started from someone who, um, who had asked me about finding, like how to find stories to tell without seeming predatory, which I thought was a really interesting word choice. <laughs> but uh, I know many of you do work in social service or work with vulnerable populations. And so this is certainly a concern for you and something that you wanna keep in mind. And I totally respect and honor that. And I think it's wonderful that you're, you're thinking about that. Um, so one of the things I would just say, if you're, you're thinking about that and trying to figure out what that can look like for your organization um, is to really make the map out the process of how you collect stories in a really collaborative way and really get input from people along the way so that you can build buy-in from different departments and different people within your organization. Um, I've worked with organizations before who have worked with victims of sexual assault. And one of the things that we always talk about is, you know, there, there's often this process for their clients where they go from victim to feeling really empowered and into a role of advocacy sometimes. Um, but that's not true for everyone. And so part of what they do in trying to figure out stories to share is trying to really identify uh, clients who have moved through that process, who have found some healing and who feel very empowered to say yes in a very consent, a consensual way, consensual way um, that allows them to share that story and hopefully won't re-traumatize them. But then the other piece that we also think about as well is how can we support someone through that process of telling the story? Um, and so sometimes that looks like talking to them at the beginning of the process and saying like, you know, what could we do for you that would be really helpful? How can we make sure you feel supported and this process feels good? Um, you know, if it's not feeling good for you, um, you know, you could stop it at any time. You can tell us, you know, you need to take a break or this just isn't working for you. Um, and really trying to, to let them know that they're, they're in charge of how that process is going to go. And so setting some... I think guidelines and, and boundaries for that is, is really helpful and something you can do to make that process really ethical and in inclusive to the people who are a part of that. All right, so let's answer some more questions. Um, yeah, Julie. So Julie asked me for some tips on telling stories to several divergent audiences. Um, and I think some of you can probably relate to this. Maybe it's something as simple as donors versus non-donors, or maybe you have people who give to different types of work that you do, um, or maybe it's people who support advocacy your organization is doing, or are just part of the general community audience of your organization and maybe aren't donors at this point. So um, when you have a couple of audiences, uh, this is where it can be really helpful sometimes to start actually segmenting your communications and your fundraising. Um, so if you have an email CRM, something like MailChimp or something else even, or even a fundraising database, this could look like you tagging people based on their audience type. So it might be indicating that they are a donor or non-donor, they're a volunteer, a board member, any of those things. And so one of the things you want to do is just take some time to figure out what are those audience segments and how can you kind of categorize them within your, your data management system. 
Um, if you don't have the ability to do that, and I know some of you won't, I wanna give you an alternative way to think about this. I would recommend just thinking about your content mix and your content calendar and making sure that you're sharing the right balance of content that has the ability to speak to those different audiences. And I say that because sometimes, whether or not we are fully cognizant of it, <laughs> sometimes we end up focusing too much on one aspect of the work or one piece of the thing that we're doing. Um, and if we're trying to really build relationships with multiple audiences, it's really helpful for us to proactively think about how are we balancing out that content and the stories we're sharing so that we are actually connecting with all the different audiences that we have um, at our nonprofit. All right, so I got a couple more questions. So for those of you tuning in, if you have a question you'd like me to answer, please feel free to send it in by the chat box. I'd be happy to answer that for you. Uh, Christina asked me, uh, we often have great stories, uh, but they tend to read like newspaper articles instead of feeling emotional. How do we change our tone? Great question. So I've had people, there's someone else who asked a similar question um, who mentioned that they had a, a journalism background and wanted to figure out how to tell a story that didn't read like a, a newspaper article that they might have written in, in another portion of their career. So here's how I would approach that. Um, and to me, this is actually one of the really interesting creative parts of how you can approach your writing and approach creating stories and content. So I like to think about the spectrum of, a, of emotion that something could have. So uh, if you were on the webinar last week, one of the things I talked about was kind of the, the wheel of emotions <laughs> that we can communicate and how there's varying intensities of something, right? So we might be like upset about something, right? Like maybe upset is like the very like unintense version of something, <laughs> but whereas like maybe we're feeling outraged about it and outraged is like the other end of the spectrum. And maybe somewhere along there's like anger and some other version of that. The point is <laughs> to think about what is that spectrum of feelings that people might have and kind of the levels of intensity of it. And what you can do when you've identified what those are or the, the kind of general spectrum of emotion you're trying to evoke for folks is then kind of think about in kind of smaller scenarios in at a sentence or paragraph level, think about what that could look, how that could play out in various sentences or paragraphs. So what I like to do is I like to go in and play around with um, maybe like one sentence in particular, one that I think I'm trying to really uh, make an impact with. So it could be like the first sentence of an email or the first sentence of an appeal. Uh, it could even be, you know, like the paragraph around the call to action, something like that. Um, and what I like to do is go in and play around with the adjectives and verbs that I, I've used in that sentence or in that paragraph. And what I try to do is create a couple of options that reflect that spectrum of emotions. So something that's like, you know, somewhat neutral and not as emotionally charged to something that feels like a 10 on that spectrum. And the point is not to like always select the 10 and always, you know, make that that kind of like intense choice. But the, the point is just to see what is the spectrum of options that you have for how you can communicate this and which feels really authentic for your organization. Because I guarantee that when you do this, you'll definitely see options where you're like, no, we would never say that, or that's like not how we would communicate this to people. Um, and it'll become really obvious to you like which of those choices feels good. But I think just doing that kind of exercise and being able to kind of go through and think about which ones make sense and which ones really reflect your organization, it's, it's actual voice and developing that voice, make it a little bit easier over time. Um, all right. Yeah. So a couple more questions here. So Caitlin asked me, uh, how do we tell stories when we're working on systemic justice issues rather than direct on the ground action? Good question. So I know some of you work for organizations where a big part of your mission and vision is really systemic uh, change, which is hard, right? That's something that's sometimes difficult to quantify and share progress on because it feels like maybe there hasn't been a lot of progress. Um, and it's also difficult to articulate what that can look like. So I wanna say that there's a couple of types of stories that I think can be really powerful when you're working on systemic issues. Um, one of those is to really tell stories that speak to your theory of change. So theory of change is definitely a, a jargony word, so I'll just unpack that a little for those of you who maybe haven't heard that before. Um, but essentially theory of change is sort of the, it's usually used on the program side of our work it's essentially the model of how we're going to bring some change to life in the community. So I always think about it as the what, the how, and the outcome. 
in a very simplistic way of <laughs> thinking about it. Um, and if you can tell stories that speak to that, I think that's really powerful. That really helps to prove out what it is we're doing, the approach we're taking, and why that's so important. I think the other types of stories you can tell around systemic issues are kind of visionary stories. So stories about a different type of future or a different type of community or you know, just a different scenario for your for your organization or the issue area that you work on. Um, I think that can be especially powerful to really tap into people's optimism that things can be different. And, and I think that's a really powerful thing to play into. Um, the other thing I would say as well, um, I would also focus on telling stories of people who are passionate about the systemic change and telling stories that articulate their values around why they're passionate about it. Because so much of what happens when we work on systemic issues is that there's often kind of like a grassroots community around us and a grassroots movement that supports that. And the more we can tell stories of people's values and what brought them to the table, what brought them to work on this issue, the more I think we can kind of build that community and build that connection for folks, which is super powerful. And uh, Caitlin, and for anyone else who might be watching this, uh, if you're interested in diving into that a little bit more, one of the models that I think is really great is Marshall Ganza's uh, community community, um, excuse me, Marshall Gans's public narrative model. Um, and in particular, he has one storytelling model called the story of self, which is a really powerful way of thinking about personal storytelling. So I definitely encourage you to check that one out if that's something you're thinking about. All right. Okay. Um, Happy to answer other questions if folks are thinking of some or if you have some that you'd like to submit in the chat box, feel free to do that. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I have one more question I'll, I'll answer uh, from Cynthia, which is, um, what is uh, one thought which, which, with which you begin documenting a story even before you write it? That's a really good question. And I was trying to think of my answer to this before we got started here. Um, because I actually think it's a really good question and really got me thinking about my own process. Um, I think something that comes to mind for me when I start documenting a story is I often, I often try to come to it with an open mind and uh, think about like, what can I learn from this? <laughs> and, then, and then in turn, what story can I tell about it? Uh, and so that's something, that's something that often comes to mind. The other the other thing that comes to mind for me a lot of times is how can I best capture this experience that someone has had? Um, because, you know, realistically, no one else can perfectly understand something that someone has been through. Um, but what can I do to do this story justice and to capture the really nuanced, important parts of it? And I think that makes me curious and stay open to the process and, and helps me kind of identify the most important parts of that story and, and articulate those eventually into some sort of written form for someone. So those are a couple of things I think about. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful for you. Um, we've been going for a little over 20 minutes and I don't see any other questions here in the chat box. Um, I definitely answered a couple here um, so far, which is great. Um, all right, oh, I see one more question here, Richard, yeah. Um, what are the keys to a good story beyond just the positive experience? What makes a shareable story and what separates the good ones from great ones? Yeah, great question, Richard. Um, I think there's a couple of things. So some of you may have heard me talk about my uh, storytelling model, which I've written about in my book and shared a number of times in the blog and here on this video, uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, so my model is kind of five parts. I talk about connection, character, conflict, resolution, and call to action as kind of five really essential parts of the story. Um, I think that that still stands for me. That was something I developed probably five or six years ago now, it was a while ago. Um, and it's still something that uh, I think is a good way to think about how you map out the story. But I think what makes a story really good at this point, kind of in the landscape that I see nonprofits operating in, um, is being able to tap into really authentic emotion and really being able to tap into values that people have in common with your organization and its work. Um, and so that's something that I think is really powerful and, and something I try to really think about carefully as I construct a story, I think about what values is this communicating and how is this really contributing to the larger narrative of stories and um, messages that our organization has about this issue and this thing that we're working on. 
So I would say that's something that I certainly think about. Um, in terms of what makes it shareable, I mean, I, I think it's almost like asking like what makes something go viral. <laughs> Sometimes you can identify what those key elements are. Um, other times, like who knows specifically what makes something, uh, you know, really shareable, really viral with an audience. Um, but I would say the best way to, in, to predict that potentially, and I say predict in a very <laughs> loose way, um, is to think about what's worked for your audience in, in the past. Like what have they responded to? What have they liked? What have they shared? Um, and looking at those trends, that data as a way, as an indicator as to what else might be good in terms of content that could get shared by them or things that would get picked up. So I would definitely recommend that. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we're going to wrap up for today. But for those of you who tuned in live, thank you so much. Um, be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you have enjoyed it. Uh, and if you're looking for more opportunities to learn about storytelling, I am hosting a webinar next week called Storytelling for Small Nonprofits. I'll put the link here in the chat box if you'd like to join me for that. We're going to be talking about how smaller organizations can manage and execute storytelling. So this would be great if you're a one-person team uh, in fundraising or communications, or maybe even an executive or director or founder who wears all the hats. So that's happening uh, next Tuesday, February 19th, and hope to see some of you there. Have a great rest of the week, everyone.